Hello again, and welcome to Botany 101. General Botany. My name is Angela Nishimoto, and I am your teacher for this class. Tonight, or today, we're actually going to be doing uh, something a little bit different, something pretty kind of exciting, you know? So we're actually going to show a video okay, on plants that the Polynesians brought. Now, when you're watching this video, please pay attention closely to the names of the plants, especially the names of the two main starch plants of the Hawaiian people, okay? So today, okay, we're doing Plants the Polynesians Brought, part one, all right? So our objectives for tonight's class, today's class, has to do with the Waianae diet and a good way to eat in terms of healthy dining, you know, taking care of your body, okay, in a diet way, and also to identify food plants that have been traditionally eaten by the Hawaiian people, okay? Those are the objectives for today. And the titles of the video that you're gonna be seeing, okay, it's divided into sections. And the first part has to do with plants important in the Hawaiian culture. Secondly, traditional Hawaiian foods and their value today, and they are valuable. Thirdly, uh, we're gonna have a video on kalo, also known as taro also known as Colocasia esculenta. And lastly, uh, the video will go into other important food plants. Okay, so before we actually start showing the video, okay, we're gonna go into a little bit, okay, about these plants. First of all, okay, Polynesians. Polynesians are the first people of the islands of Hawaii. Right? And of course, the people who came here, the first people, came by canoe. So what you see here is an illustration you know, by an early uh, artist to the Hawaiian Islands. And you can see that there are some men in a double hull canoe. You can see that the hull of the canoe itself is colored black. And generally this upper part here, I think it's called the gunnel, is, is probably more like a golden yellow color. So Hawaiian canoes are very, very beautiful. Okay. Another thing is you see uh, that, of course, you had plant materials being used to make the canoe, including uh, koa, usually for the hull, and oftentimes for this uh, gunnel, people would be using ahakea, okay, or other, uh, some such um, a wood plant. Another thing is that the sail, this uh, very characteristic crab call sprit sail used by the Hawaiians, and, and they were the only people in Polynesia to use it, had a, a plated kind of sail made out of hala, okay, also known as pandanus. Another thing, uh, so here you can see a man, a man with a, a headgear on. So these might have been men who were on their way to do some important work of some kind, okay? Anyway, so people came to the islands of Hawaii by canoe, okay? Another thing that's pretty important is that Hawaii, here in the very northern part of Polynesia, you have the Polynesian Triangle with Aotearoa, also known as New Zealand in this corner. You also have um, um, Rapa Nui, also known as Easter Island in this corner, and the Hawaiian Islands to the north, okay? So this is a triangle that comprises the islands of Polynesia, and of course, Polynesia means many islands. So the Hawaiian Islands, okay, are remarkable for their isolation. They're more than 2,000 miles away from the nearest high islands, which would have been the Marquesas in this direction, more than 2,000 miles away from the nearest continent, which would be North America. So the Hawaiian Islands are noteworthy for their isolation, okay? And of course, the people who first came here would have been expert navigators, and the Polynesians are people who sailed back and forth across the Pacific over millennia, okay, over thousands of years, right? They're expert okay, in canoe handling, canoe building, and also um, um, sailing itself, Polynesian voyaging, as people call it now, which is very important. And then, of course, one of the things these people knew is that they knew that to, uh, to colonize a new place, that they had to bring their own food plants, because when you think about it, the native flora of Hawaii doesn't really have any kind of food plants that could serve as a carbohydrate basis of a diet. So the people, these people, you know, brought their own food plants, okay? And so these would be uh, plants that ha have traditionally been part of the Hawaiian diet, okay? All right. And among these, most of them would be angiosperms or flowering plants, 
right? You might think about you might not think about some of these plants as being flowering, but they actually are. Okay. Now another thing too is that another important source of vitamins and minerals, especially to women, because in the old days women were the experts in limu. Okay, limu in the olden days used to uh, 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 have under an umbrella term uh, both. Uh, sea algae or oceanic algae, also uh, algae of freshwater areas, okay? Also mosses and other types of uh, plants that live near watery areas, such as liverworts, okay? Nowadays, limu more, is more likely to be referring to sort of plants like these, that are algae that live in oceanic environments. So this is actually showing green algae of a type that is known as limu ele ele. Okay, also known as enteromorpha. And what we see here, you see that these algae are green, okay, because you can actually classify algae into three groups, the macroalgae anyway. One group are called the chlorophyta, okay, and these are the green algae. And another kind are the red algae. Red algae oftentimes are reddish or pinkish or purplish in color, but sometimes they can fool you. Sometimes they can look green. Sometimes they can look brown, but these different kinds of algae, the green algae and the red algae, are classified according to the kind of pigments that are present in these plants. Now the third type of macroalgae are called the brown algae, the phaophyta. Okay? So the chlorophyta are the green algae, the rhodophyta are the red algae, and the phaophyta are the brown algae. And um, this one here is not really native to Hawaii, but it is a kind of brown alga. And you can see usually brown algae are brown, okay? So there are, you know, pretty much in Hawaii, all the different kind of limu are edible, okay? Maybe people preferred some kinds over the others, all right? But generally the limu, everything you can eat, except for the ones that were used in reef building, okay? Because those have uh, calcium uh, deposits in them. Okay, otherwise, you can pretty much eat any kind of algae. And these are very, very nutritious and were a source of very important vitamins and minerals okay, to people, especially to women. All right? And another thing about the, uh, the Hawaiian diet, diet is that the different kinds of foods that were traditionally eaten by Hawaiian people was very healthy. One of the very noteworthy things that uh, 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 visitors to the islands, the first visitors to Hawaii first said, is that the people were very well formed and very healthy. Because a lot of people at the time, you know, in the 1700s, many people in other places in the world, you know, had, had uh, problems with their health. But here, people were very, very healthy. Okay, so Hawaiian people were noteworthy for being well-formed, strong-looking, and very, very healthy in all aspects. Okay? All right? Now, uh, so the uh, first part of the video, we're going to talk about the YNI diet. And this is one that has been put forth and kind of formulated by uh, an MD who is also a nutritionist, and his name is Dr. Sh Terry Shintani. Okay? And this YNI diet is based on whole plant foods. That means uh, getting all of the plant, not just extracting parts of it, like you would have with white rice or other kind of refined foods. And this kind of diet is based on things like poi or taro, okay? taro eaten in chunks, or poi, okay? which is made from taro or kalo, also sweet potato, all right? and other foods, all right? whole plant foods. Another thing, too, is also we had, uh, 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 based on these carbohydrates, whole plant foods carbohydrates, this is just an illustration showing amylose, one component of carbohydrates, or starch, which is deposited in plants. And here's another image, and this is of amylopectin. So those are two elements that make up starch okay, in plants. And most diets in the world are based on some kind of carbohydrate base. Okay. One kind of important source of starch, very important, so remember the name of this plant, is the kalo, also known as Colocasia esculenta, very important. Okay. The kalo could be uh, baked in an emu, okay. and they, uh, generally the Hawaiian people had more than 300 different names for taro. It's sort of like when you think of the um, Alaskan natives, they have all those you know, dozens and dozens of terms for snow, so people tend to have a lot of names for plants or any other kind of factor in their environment that is very important to them. So taro was extremely important okay, to the Hawaiian people, not just as food, but in other ways too. Now the kalo was usually you know, pounded, mixed with water, and eaten as poi. Okay, that was the form most preferred.
Okay, and even now, it's very hard to keep poi in the supermarket. As soon as people find out that there's poi there, it disappears, you know, within just a couple of hours probably. Okay, because it's in high demand. People cannot actually, I mean, people who are farmers cannot actually supply enough kalo for poi that people like and, need, and like to eat, even now. Another thing about kalo that makes it a preeminent food is that it was very, it is very important in Hawaiian culture, even today. Okay, so the origins of the kalo are tied with the origins of the Hawaiian people. All right, very important. And uh, the Hawaiian people respect the kalo and consider it such as their elder brother, okay, like a relative to them. It sustains them and in turn, they take care of their elder brother, okay? Now another kind of carbohydrate source for people, especially on the leeward side, is the uala, also known as sweet potato, ipomia batatas, okay? So this is actually the sweet potato, uala. All right, very important, and generally people tended to grow these in mounds, okay, in, in patches. And this plant can actually grow in uh, partly volcano soils that don't have very much, you know, good topsoil in it, but they grow very well. They form root tubers and very good to eat, as anybody who sits down to a Thanksgiving meal nowadays eat now too. Very delicious, yes? So other starchy food that, that the Hawaiian people also had part of their diet include the ulu, Artocarpus altilis, also known as a breadfruit. Here's a huge breadfruit tree, and as you can see, this beautiful leaf of the breadfruit is actually one of the main motifs that people use in Hawaiian quilting, okay? That's a good thing to get into if you can, okay? And this is a, uh, an image of, you can see part of the breadfruit leaf, or the leaf of the ulu and the female inflorescences that are uh, developing into fruits. You can even see here a little bit of that kind of milky, milky latex of the ulu plant. So if you actually pick a fruit, it has a sap that drips, drips down. This is a close-up of the female flowers after they've been pollinated and fertilized. Okay, so this part here is ovary, okay, one, one flower. This is a style in the stigma, drying up and shriveling up after pollination and fertilization. And this whole thing will eventually develop into the, the fruit, which is a multiple fruit. fruit. Uh, multiple fruit is a is a fruit that develops from many flowers. So each of these actually stand for a single female flower, okay? Because this plant has female flowers and they also have male flowers. And here is a male flowers and the male inflorescence. And you can see here the anthers, okay, which develop the pollen, okay? So here you have male flowers, female flowers on the same plant. What is that called? Can you remember? They're on the same plant, male flowers, female flowers. That's called monisi, okay, monisi, one house. It's like men and women both living in the same house, okay, just like in, in a marriage. Another important food plant, but not generally to women. Generally, it's kind of held to, held to be that in the olden days, uh, women could only eat three varieties of banana, okay? Uh, the others were kapu to them. Right, but maya is another starch plant too. You can have uh, cooking bananas, and you can have bananas that you eat raw. Okay, musa. Another thing about the um, uh, musa plant, anyway. So you can see here that it does actually develop, you know, from flowers. Yeah, but these generally come uh, about through uh, parthenogenesis. Remember parthenogenesis? When you have flowers that actually uh, develop into fruit without the benefit of pollination. Okay. Another starch sauce, a uh, uh, starch uh, starch source for people. Okay, was the ape, Alocasia macrorhiza. You can see this one here has a really huge leaf. It could actually the uh, corm, the underground horizontal root, could actually be taken, baked in an emu, and eaten in chunks. This was not a food that was greatly favored. Really, people really really preferred poi above all else. Okay, poi and some kind of seafood. Okay. And we also had different kinds of yams, okay, including the uhi, including the pia, and including the hoi. So here's a picture of hoi. And you can see, okay, that even though yams sort of resemble, in a way, they do resemble um, sweet potato, they're actually very different. The sweet potato is a dicot. Okay, remember dicots? They have netted venation. This one here, the different kinds of uh, yams are actually monocots. You can see you have parallel venation in the main veins of this, this plant's leaves, okay? So generally, uh, both yams and sweet potato are not related to each other hardly at all, okay? Next, okay, we also have uh, 
Pia, also known as Taca leontopetaloides. Right? This is a Polynesian arrowroot. It's not seen very often nowadays, but still, it has this beautiful leaf, okay, just gorgeous, this, um, dissected uh, leaf, and then here you have the inflorescence. Very, very uh, interesting. It's also one of the few plants that grow in Hawaii that is deciduous. That means the upper part of the plant grows and develops, flowers, fruits, and then after it's ready to be dug up, that's when the leaves actually turn a yellow color, and you can actually dig up okay, the underground part of it and use it to make haupia. That's where haupia comes from. They actually use a starch from the pia. Okay. Now some other edible plants, okay, including what some people term famine foods. One author says that, you know, in the olden days they didn't really have famine. There really was enough food for people. When they say famine food, this person says, or the, the sources say, they say that um, they, it, it was more like referring to the fact that people couldn't get the food they liked best, such as taro or for poi, okay? So other edible plants. So there were other plants that people could eat, okay, when there were food shortages. One of them, of course, was a neo, but neo was kapu to women completely, partly because the neo uh, is actually a kinolau, or a plant body form of the god ku. Okay? Neo, also known as cocos nicifera, now we know it as coconut. Okay? So women completely, you know, they couldn't uh, use any part of the coconut. It was completely kapu to them. So they couldn't eat haupia. You know, that seems a shame because, of course, that's one of the most delicious desserts you could ever have. And in the olden days, I guess they would make the haupia with grating uh, coconut milk, okay, which it was, is a process in and of itself, how to make that. Also, um, sweet, uh, sugar cane juice, okay, and then also the starch from the pia. All right, very delicious. This is like really one of the best desserts. Okay, and then uh, this is actually showing the different kinds of flower. You have a male flower, and you have a female flower, which will develop into the fruit. Okay, and the new has barriers to self pollination, such as the males will the male flower will become mature at a different time than the female flowers do. That prevents um, the male flowers on the same inflorescence from fertilizing you know, a female flower on its own inflorescence. So it actually encourages outcrossing. Remember, remember what outcrossing is or cross-pollination? When you have pollen from a different plant going on to the female of the other plant, that ensures pretty much uh, vigor and hardiness. Okay. And another plant, which was edible plant and people enjoy even now, okay, not so common now as before, the ohia ai, also known as mountain apple, Sizigia malicensi, malicensi. And here you can see the flowers, okay, on here, right on the trunk. And this kind of flowering is called cauliflory, when you have the flowers developing right off the main trunk. It's a beautiful tree, okay? And here's a close-up of the flowers. Here you can see the stamens sticking out here pretty well. Okay, so these flowers, of course, are very similar to the ohia lehua flowers. And, and of course, this is, they're saying ohia ai is the edible ohia. Yeah, so people recognize the differences, I mean, and the similarities between plants as well. Okay, and here are the fruit of the ohia ai. Yeah, mountain apple. Very good, very delicious, especially if you like fruit that is not too sweet. The fruit is also astringent. I think you could eat it if you have like running stomach and parts of that plant too. Okay, it's astringent. That means that it takes water okay, out of your stool. Okay, it, make, it helps you dry you up a little bit if you have running stomach. Okay. Then we also have the noni. The noni, of course, nowadays very famous for its use medicinally. But in the olden days, people could eat the fruit. It doesn't, you know, if, you have to kind of acquire a taste for it. Okay. All right. But the noni is um, edible. Okay. Other edible plants okay, include the kukui. Okay, you can make a relish from the kernel inside of the nut. Okay. The plant was also used medicinally in various ways and also as a dye plant, okay, a plant to get dyes from, four different types. The key, the cordelini fruticosa, you might not think of the tea plant as being a source of food, but you could actually bake the root in, the, in an oven. It's very sweet. It's almost like molasses candy. Dr. Abbott says that, Dr. Elizabeth Abbott. Okay. Ipu is another plant that in times of hardship, you could actually have edible ipu, okay? This is one that happens to have a rather long, skinny fruit, and some of them, of course, are very big. They actually had the ipu nui. They were huge, okay, a couple of feet in diameter, all right? Okay, we also have hala, okay? So hala has actually female on one plant, and the male inflorescence, known as hinano, on the, on the male plant. And in this case, you have female on one plant, 
male on the other, and this is called daisi, right? Two houses. Okay, very beautiful photographs here. Also the ohe, you can also eat a shoot of the ohe, as well as using it for other utilitarian purposes. Okay. Okie doke, so generally, okay, so we also uh, haven't talked very much about the edible plants of the ocean, such as the limu, but it really is important because many of them, of course, were native and not introduced to, okay, and they could be called limu or macroalgae or seaweeds, all right? Anyway, so now we're going to start, um, we're actually going to be starting to uh, show the video in just a couple of minutes, so just relax and enjoy it. Pay attention to the names, though, and about how they're used. Okay, and then uh, we'll see you in a bit, okay? In Hawaii long ago, the people who lived on the islands for almost 2,000 years got all they needed for life from the sea and land. This is a feat of no small achievement hard for us to comprehend today. We depend on massive shipments of food and supplies by ship and by air. In contrast, all the first Polynesians brought with them was a small handful of seeds and a few cuttings of plants. These they were able to grow successfully and support a large population, possibly as large as today's. This is a story about these valuable plants, numbering less than 30. It explores what they look like, how they were grown, and how they were used. We start our journey in the valley of Waimea on the island of Oahu. In the past, it was an important valley home for about 1,000 Hawaiians. Today it is a cultural and botanical park, preserving much of this special heritage. Hello, I'm Priscilla Millen, instructor of botany at Leeward Community College. I'm at Waimea Valley, home of Waimea Arboretum and Botanic Gardens. To see and to learn about the plants the Polynesians took with them to Hawaii and how they used them in their culture. If the Polynesians had not brought these plants, the Hawaiian culture would have been different and the large population wouldn't have developed. As in many human migratory events of history, the Polynesians took with them the plants that they knew and on which they depended. Most of them took root and thrived in Hawaii. Botanists believe the plants known as Polynesian introductions came very early in the colonizing period of the Hawaiian Islands, about 1600 years ago. Because they were introduced, that is, came to the islands with the help of humans, they are not native plants, even though now some grow unassisted in the wild. True native plants come to a place without any human help. The Polynesian introduced plants can be divided into several groups by their uses. For food, fibers, wood, dyes, containers, musical instruments, and medicines. Part 2, Traditional Hawaiian Foods and Their Value Today. Speaking of food, it's about noontime and I'm getting hungry. I'm supposed to meet Winston here. He's a friend of mine and plant propagator at Waimea. I had my fast food lunch here. Where's, where's Winston? Hi, Winston. Hi, hey, good to see you. Nice to see you again. Oh, look, I brought my lunch and uh, looks like you have something here too. Sure do. What kind of food are you eating here? This looks kind of strange. This is the type of food that Hawaiian people would have eaten. It's my lunch. Right here in the center is poi, which is made from the kalapan or taro. 
This right here is maya, or banana. This is uala, the sweet potato. And this is limu, seaweed. And this right here is tea leaf that on the inside has uh, luau, or the taro leaves. The Hawaiian's called this lao lao. Mm. You want to try some? It's delicious. Okay. Mm. Well, that's kind of good. So um, people still like to eat these kinds of foods. Not only do they still like to eat it, but it's actually way better for you than that bag of fast food that you brought for yourself today, you know. There's mm -hmm. a doctor and a trained nutritionist who um, is named Dr. Shintani, and he's done some studies on the traditional Hawaiian diet and found that Hawaiians are able to attain better health and weight loss by returning to their traditional diet. Well, really, um, well, these foods are low in fat and they're very high in nutritional quality, so that's understandable, but to lose weight and to lessen medical problems, how can eating these foods accomplish that? Well, why don't we go and see Dr. Shintani? He can explain that to us. It'll only take a minute. Oh, okay. Dr. Shintani, it's really a pleasure to be here today, and, and Winston and I were talking about the Hawaiian, traditional Hawaiian foods, and we understand that if you eat those and um, use them in your diet, that it really helps in preventing um, types of diseases as well as actually loss of weight. Is that possible? Yeah, absolutely. And uh, in the Waianae Diet Program, which we uh, conducted uh, several years ago, we actually demonstrated that you could uh, not only reverse risk factors for a number of diseases, uh, but uh, actually eat more food and still lose weight. Now, how does that actually happen? I mean, Well, the, the reason that happens is when you eat whole foods, especially traditional Hawaiian foods, but actually you can use whole foods from uh, just about any culture in the world, uh, the uh, calorie density, uh, that is the number of calories there are in the food compared to how much the food weighs, is actually quite low, which means you can eat a lot of food and still not get that many calories. You fill your stomach up, uh, you'll be satisfied, you don't have to eat small little portion sizes, uh, and uh, the weight comes off s while you feel satisfied, and while there's no calorie restriction. So, what would be an example of foods or foods that you would, how much you would eat that would actually uh, fill you up that way? Well, before we started the Wainai Diet Program, we knew people were going to lose weight simply because, let's take for the, the example of poi, in order to get one full day's calories worth of poi, person would have to eat 9.1 pounds. Do you think very many people can eat that much poi in one day? Can you eat that much in one sitting? Or? No. Yeah. Well, so the point is, they could eat until they were full, and they would still lose the weight, because you couldn't eat enough to, to gain weight. And uh, we analyzed all the foods in the traditional Hawaiian uh, diet, and that included uh, sweet potato, breadfruit, and other staples of that kind, uh, uh, taro, of course, mm -hmm. uh, the luau leaf, and all of them had a profile of nutrient to weight uh, that uh, would promote weight loss. Well, I understand now about how you can eat more and weigh less, but what is it about the diet that really seems to help with different chronic um, diseases or problems people might have? Well, uh, aside from helping people to manage their weight, uh, the whole plant-based foods that we focus our uh, diet on helps to lower, for example, cholesterol and risk from heart disease. Uh, first of all, because uh, the traditional Hawaiian diet, or the way we uh, recommend foods be eaten, focuses on plant-based foods uh, rather than uh, a meat-based diet, which most Americans eat. Uh, the center of, of our plate in the Hawaiian diet program is whole uh, uh, starchy foods such as taro, poi, sweet potato, and that kind of thing. And as you know, there's no cholesterol in any plant-based food. All the cholesterol comes from animal-based products such as beef, pork, chicken, turkey, uh, fish, uh, and of course uh, dairy products such as cheese and milk and egg yolks. Uh, the Waianae Diet Program or, and the diet that uh, we recommend uh, is very low in cholesterol because of its plant-based uh, plant food focus. Uh, that's number one. Number two, 
Uh, it's very low in fat. Most Americans eat somewhere between 36 to 42 percent fat, partly as a result of the high intake of animal products. Uh, our diet is, uh, and the diet of most cultures around the world uh, prior to um, modern Western influence, was around 10 percent fat. 10 percent of its calories came from fat. And that's what we do on our program uh, in the traditional Hawaiian phase and the transition diet. And keeping the fat that low also helps to lower uh, cholesterol. Uh, in terms of uh, control of diabetes, uh, that also is a result of the uh, predominance of whole plant-based foods. Because the foods are so high in fiber, uh, they help to modulate the absorption of uh, carbohydrate, that is, both starches and sugars. And this helps to make the, uh, the blood sugar control a lot more manageable in terms of people who have diabetes. Also, fat itself can actually impair the action of insulin. When people are on high fat diets, uh, there's, there are studies that indicate that uh, the uh, function of insulin is uh, impaired to some extent so that their blood sugar is more difficult to control. Uh, and of course, uh, if they're eating whole uh, plant-based foods, the, uh, the number of calories that they take in, as we discussed earlier, uh, actually is less and spaced out throughout the day. Um, uh, we actually have some uh, good examples of people who've been able to control diabetes. And uh, today, I've, uh, I've brought one of our uh, former participants uh, to talk to you about that. Great. Hello. You're Mary, right? Yes. yes. Mary, how has uh, the diet helped you in your life? Well, for me, the diet did a great big change in my whole life. Um, before, the reason why I went on the diet is because I am a diabetic, and I lost my mother through diabetes, so it's in my family genes, it's in my family, um, it's hereditary for us. I went on the diet through a friend of mine, his name is Ed, he's not here today, but um, he got me onto the diet. I met him at a support group, diabetes support group, and he asked if I wanted to get well. I said yes, I wanted to get well because I tried all different diets and it never worked. So when I first went on the diet, um, I was 206 pounds. I took insulin in the morning. I took 45 units of insulin in the morning, and I took 48 units of insulin in the evening. So I was on a high dosage of insulin. We went through our health assessment with Terry. The first day on the diet, he cut my insulin down to 10 units. And I was saying to myself, is that OK? Will I be all right on 10 units of insulin? I was scared because you know, I didn't know what would happen to me. And I didn't know from the foods alone that would help me. So the first day on the diet, I was OK. I didn't feel anything. I was all right. Through the day I worked, I was fine. The second day on the diet, I started to get sick. And I was wondering, oh, what's wrong? How come I feel sick? And I was still on 10 units of insulin. And then about the third day, Terry told me to drop it down to five units. So I was taking five units on the third day, and I was getting more sick. And I told my boss, I have to go home. I'm not feeling well. I couldn't concentrate. Everything, I couldn't remember nothing. And we were running to the bathroom every time, because my boss and I both were on the diet. On the fifth day, Terry called me in the morning and he told me to stop taking my insulin. My blood sugars had dropped down to normal, and I was happy. I was so happy. I, oh, I told my boss, and she was really happy. So from that fifth day, when he told me not to take um, insulin, I noticed to my weight, I was losing a lot of weight. I was losing weight, and I said, no, this can't be, because in the morning, we ate taro sweet potato, and we had banana, and our Hawaiian tea. For snack, we had taro and sweet potato. <laughs> and then for lunch, we had taro and sweet oh, potato, poi. And uh, we had um, lavalu, we had chicken for lunch, and we had our salads. We had tomato and onions, and sometimes we had um, ohio, which we call the fern shoots. We had that as a salad, or watercress. We had, uh, we had, at least the salads we had changed. 
dinner we had taro sweet potato toy. Oh, <laughs> same you, you thing. thought you weren't going to be losing any weight. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and with us eating the same foods every day, we were starting, we were saying, oh no, we got to eat taro. <laughs> so for me, I adjusted my taro. I ate poi. Um, I took poi for snacks, and I could eat that more. I noticed I could eat more poi than I could eat taro. Oh. So it, about the second week, my body changed. I could feel it changing because mm. I became more energetic. I could function better than I used to function, where I usually would fall asleep because I'm so tired. And then about the third week, I felt really good. I exercised, I learned how to exercise because I would not exercise. <laughs> and all of us in the diet as a family, we all went, we all exercised mm -hmm. together, we stayed together and it really helped me too with my family support. Wow. That was my main support because when we would take our food home for lunch, even on the weekends, you know, you're not eating there. You're watching what your family eats. Uh, but I said, oh, no, I ain't cheating because they're going to find out. They'll take it through <laughs> my blood. They'll find out I'm cheating. <laughs> I'm not cheating. So with the foods I had eaten and how it had made me better was I found out traditionally the foods really helped us. You know, by eating what we ate before, it helped, it helped me to lose weight. It helped me to get off insulin. And in September this year, I'll be five years off of insulin. Oh, gosh. It's wonderful. Yeah. And I'd also like you to know that you can get the same results using traditional food from any culture. You can yeah. use potatoes. You can use brown rice. You can use pastas. Uh, part of the Waianae diet includes uh, what we call transitional foods, uh, which includes all of these foods. You have you have an infinite variety of things that you can eat, uh, uh, things that we're familiar with uh, that uh, are easy and inexpensive to obtain so that uh, anyone could do it uh, and do it uh, inexpensively and conveniently. Yeah, I think Mary's been able to do that in her uh, everyday life. Yes, I have. Um, I've learned how to eat brown rice, which I never ate after after our diet, they taught us how to cook brown rice, how I could um, eat pasta and use a vegetarian sauce with that. And I got to, to eat a lot of vegetables. I never ate vegetables before, but after the diet, oh, I love my vegetables. Yeah. I can eat it without salad dressing. Just like that, I can eat vegetables. But there's a lot of way I learned how to cook all different types of food. And tofu, I got to, to love tofu. Mm. I make a tofu burger with vegetables, and I like that. <laughs> Dr. Shantani and Mary, we really appreciate you uh, coming, being with us today and sharing us uh, with this information. Mahalo. Yeah, thank you for including us in your program. We really appreciate that. Oh, you're welcome. Wow, all this talking about foods made me pretty hungry. Let me oh. see if we get some lunch. Sounds okay. like a good idea. Well, that was a great visit, huh? It was, yes. See, now you know why eating these types of foods will make you feel better. I can sure understand it now. Mm -hmm. Let's get down and eat your lunch. Oh, okay. Um, I, don't, I don't think I want to eat this right now too much. You want to eat some of mine? Oh, please, may I? Sure. Ooh. Part three, Kalo. The food plant called kalo by the Hawaiians is more commonly known as taro in the rest of Polynesia. Kalo was the most important food for the Hawaiians, and their use, varieties, and skill in cultivation is not matched by any other Polynesian culture. In the Hawaiian legend, kalo was born of the sky god Wakea and the earth goddess Papa. This firstborn child died and was buried. From the grave, the plant kalo sprung up. Ha'aloa was second born from this union and became the ancestor of all people. To the Hawaiians, Kalo was so sacred that it preceded the creation of humans in their mythology, making it their most important plant. Kalo or taro is ancient, grown in tropical and subtropical Asia over 10,000 years. The Hawaiians took the culture of Kalo to its highest level and developed several hundred types. Well, Priscilla, kalo is a long-lived herb that forms about a foot-long heart-shaped leaves here 
It also grows from an underground tuber that's called a corm, like this here. And it reproduces by uh, producing side shoots that come out from the bottom there. And the Hawaiians call them oha. And uh, the Hawaiian word ohana actually means uh, family. Oh, so in this case, the, the larger center plant is like the parent, and then the keikis or the little ones are around it, mm -hmm. um, like a family. Yes. Well, other, other features of the uh, kawo plant are these long petioles or leaf stems called ha, mm -hmm. and where they attach to the leaf is called the pico, which is another word for navel, which it resembles. And the pico attachment is toward the center of the leaf, not right at the leaf edge. So that's another characteristic of the plant. Also, the leaves, the tips tend to be downward pointing very strongly, and that distinguishes it from ape, which is a uh, similar related plant. Mm -hmm. Well, Priscilla, we find that the Hawaiians used parts of the plant to help describe the names of them. For example, they could maybe name it according to the color of the corm, or the color of the ha, or the petiole, or perhaps they would use the leaf, the size, or shape, or maybe the color of the pico as well. Um, an interesting thing to note about the Hawaiians is that they also cross-named uh, their taros and plants according to other creatures from the earth. And uh, what we have right there is a real beautiful kalo that's uh, real tasty and called manini ovali. And its Hawaiian name is reflective of the manini fish. You can see that it has stripes, oh, purple yeah. stripes, They're like similar. manini. Mm -hmm. Yeah. This one also is named after a fish. This particular kalo is called kumu. And the fish here is kumu as well. And there's even a um, sugar cane that the Hawaiians call ko or kumu ko. Yeah. Oh, and, and was there any purpose for some of this cross naming or ways it was used? Mm, yeah, you could actually, if you didn't have kumu as the fish for ho'okupu or offering, uh, you could use the kumu kalo or kumu ko as the substitute. Offering. Kind yeah, of. yeah. Oh. This right here is a really beautiful uh, taro that's called uahia pele. And it must have reminded the Hawaiians that named this of the smoky color of Pele's eruption because of its color. It's reflective of the smoke of Pele. And this right here is a ko or sugar cane that too is called uh, Uahia Pele. And you can find that uh, they would also name uh, tarot according to creatures like birds. And this one right here has a real beautiful uh, patchwork variegation that's reflective of the elepayo. Uh, the elepayo is a native forest bird. And this turtle, too, is called Elipayo. And it has splotches of white on it. Like yes. That. Oh. There's, there's a very special uh, kala right behind you, which is um, has a cup-shaped leaf, and it's called Apu uh, Yes. which means cup of water, because literally the uh, water is collected in the leaf, and Hawaiians considered it sacred and special water. That way mm -hmm. it hadn't touched the ground, mm -hmm. and it was collected and used for special blessing ceremonies. Well, this um, cultivation behind us is a dry type of cultivation, mm. and both uh, a lot of taros could be grown under dry or wet conditions. Uh, there's a very interesting place we can go to, which um, has grown the taro in the wet conditions for hundreds of years in ponds called lo'i. Mm. Want to go there? Sure. <laughs> We're here in the beautiful Waiholi Valley, and this is Mr. Uh, Paul Rapoon, and he's going to very graciously offer to tell us something about this very historic place and about growing the kalo and how it is harvested and replanted. Yeah, we're beginning at the end of the taro cycle here, pulling the taro. This taro was planted uh, about 15 months ago, and uh, it's a long time to go. And it's, at its peak, it was probably about over my head height tall and it gets up that height you know after about eight nine months it starts to shrink back down and as it shrinks back down the corn starts to fill out so when we pull the tower we loosen it up this tower has quite a bit of root still but it's not quite ready to pull okay now this is what we call the makua tower and this bottom right here was the base of the huli that was planted we don't save the huli from the mother tower because it starts to become small we save the huli from the oha this is the oha. You see where it was attached to the mother corn. All together, the oha and the makua make the ohana. That's where the word ohana comes from, is from the taro plant. It's the same uh, Hawaiian style of the taro as their older brother. 
you open this door. The older brother, so it was very important to them. He had seniority over them. It was more important than they were themselves. When we cut our huli, cut the leaves off, and they would leave about an eighth of an inch of the farm, and this is what we call a huli. That huli, of course, means to turn and to go back, so it's going to come back to, it's going to be the next generation. So in a sense, we've got the same tower plant that has been growing for the last thousand years, maybe. But we're just cutting off the top and putting it back in the ground. It's really the same plant. We'll let this dry up for three or four days so it has a nice skin on the bottom. And not in this patch, but in another patch, we'll just stick it into the mud and replant it like that. Stick it down about so far. And that completes the, the cycle of the crop. And uh, when we... The reason we grow a wetland taro and not dryland taro is the, the wetland taro is um, more productive. It's about one third more higher yield than the dryland taro. And also the quality of the corn is different. It's more starchy, more gummy. And it makes a, a stickier poi, higher, better quality poi, what I call better quality, although dryland taro farmers might not think so. But it's a lot less work to grow wetland taro too because the weeds are controlled by the water. And uh, most of the work consists of cutting the grass on the banks and keeping it from going into the field. Uh, 50 months is a long time to wait. A lot of different factors can affect the, the crop. The amount of sunlight, the amount of rain, what kind of fertilizer, what kind of planting material, uh, how much water you got flowing in it. There's so many different factors involved that uh, as a taro farmer, you can feel like you're never going to learn it all. I've been growing taro for 20 years, and I feel like I have more questions than I have answers. And I'll never know all there is to know. That's one of the things I like about this crop. It's, it's not a simple crop. It's a complicated crop. Um, it's also got a whole other dimension to it in that uh, planting taro, this huli here, this is like um, a stick of dynamite. It's, it's got um, political power. You plant huli, and you... You say that the uh, water should stay in the streams, and you say that uh, uh, you got a place to have uh, endangered species live in the tower pass. I think you, you're you talking about a long-term kind of a farming project. This is going to be in the ground. It's going to go generations after generations. Just like the people, the farmers on the land are generations after generations. Our kid, our children are our huli. And so we're just like the tower plant. There's a real close relationship there. So it's the kind of farming that we like to think about as community-based, family-based farming. It's there for the long haul. And it's, taro is a, it's a, a metaphor for the human condition in that sense. Um, we found out very early that farming was a political act because one of the first things we planted was taro and uh, water, water supply was going up in the mountain above us and taking the water. The waterfalls dried up and Farmers thought it was an act of God, but it turned out that the water water supply wasn't God. So we got involved in that very early fighting over water. We're still involved in it. Uh, there's not very much taro left, and there's a heavy competition between farming, especially taro farming, uh, agricultural uses of the water, and, and ag uses in the ecosystem, and the need for water to flow into the ocean, where it's, where it's actually not being wasted, it's being used to grow fish and to make their estuary more healthy and then on the other side you've got municipal and domestic industrial uses of water we need to think about how many people we want to live on our land we need to think about what's the carrying capacity we need to think about self-sufficiency we need to think about those kinds of things you've got forever on this subject i don't know if you've got any questions you said these uh carrier patches only are very old how far back do they go I don't know how far back to go. My, my guess would be hundreds of years, four or five hundred years. When we started farming here, there was, it was just overgrown with grass. Although it was about uh, maybe 15 years before that that somebody had farmed it. Um, I think they're ancient. I think they're ancient cow patches. Uh, how many varieties of kala do you have growing in your lobby here? I would guess we have maybe 40 varieties. Of that, there's probably three or four that are more or less what we call commercial. Our main commercial variety is moi, moi taro. Uh, Why is that, the moi? 
Uh, the Moy is a, it's a real hardy tarot. It's not delicate. It's, it's a good keeping tarot. It's, it's a real high yielding tarot. The yield from tarot to poi is real high. Uh, you can walk in the patch and disturb the roots somewhat and without hurting it too much. It's just a real durable tarot. It does real well in this place. It, and every place is different. Some places like different kinds of tarot. So we grow a lot of moi, we grow a lot of lehua because a little bit of lehua mixed with the moi tarot gives it some color. And people are used to the color. They're used to that kind of thing. We grow also a manala loa. This one here is manala loa uh, because it's so delicious. Yeah. And we grow lots of other kinds. My favorite is um, kai, I think kai ala. They're very fragrant tarot, very hard, very fragrant. But not as easy to grow. It's, it's more delicate. I see a lot of flowers in this bed. Yeah. yeah. Do you throw flowers often? Springtime, you usually see a lot of flowering. Some varieties more than others. The moi sees the flower quite a bit. Um, the flowers, of course, they're edible. They're oh, yeah. very fragrant. How do you eat them? You, just cook, you cook them like luau, as far as I know. I don't care for it myself. It tastes too much like eating uh, plumerias or something. <laughs> Not the taste, but the smell. The smell is so strong. Yeah. It's supposed to be good for pregnant women oh, yeah. eating the flower. But sometimes in the early morning, when the air is real still, and the tower is all flowering, there'll be a very strong smell to it. A delicate smell, but a strong smell. Yeah. And it's, it's a really nice thing. Real nice. The tower flower is a beautiful flower. Do they ever produce seed that you could grow uh, more plants? Um, They're pretty rare. Some people have been have pollinated them by hand and put and, and crossed different varieties of tower that's been done. I don't really see the need for that since we have so many varieties of taro it's hard to imagine improving on it but uh, our, our main problems are not lack of varieties it's lack of um, you might say political will on the part of the government to help taro farmers and keep them secure those are the kinds of problems that are more important than varieties uh, new diseases have come in too uh, because taro from other places comes to Hawaii uh, we actually don't grow all the taro we can eat right now so some of it's imported, and there's problems with new diseases coming in. Uh, something we got to deal with. Well, Mr. Rapun, mahalo. Thank you very much for showing us your tarot, and uh, good luck to you in the future and your loti here. We really appreciate the time you spent with us, and uh, thank you very much again. Mahalo. <laughs> Part 4. Other important Polynesian introduced food plants are the sweet potato, or uwala, yam, or uhi, and breadfruit, or ulu. Foods which gave their diet variety are banana, or maia, coconut, or niu, mountain apple, or ohia ai, Polynesian arrowroot, or pia, and sugarcane, or ko. Well, Priscilla, the plant ape looks a lot like kalo, but usually its leaves are a bit larger and upward pointing in the way that they grow. Its large basal stem, like what we have here, can be cooked like kalo and was eaten, but usually only eaten during times of food scarcity. I had a lot of baked um, ape in Polynesian countries I visited this summer, so it can be used as a, a staple food. However, this Hawaiian ape is pretty rare on the islands today. You don't see it very often. and Actually, another related plant um, is called ape. Hmm. The next most important plant, um, food plant for the Hawaiians was the sweet potato, or uala. And here you can see the plant with these uh, pinkish lavender morning glory type flowers, and it does belong to the morning glory family. It's, the plant itself is, is a vine, and um, it has heart-shaped leaves. Well, the roots of this plant come in uh, different forms, ranging from round to spindly shape and formation, and also the color of the flesh of the plant ranges from white to a deep purple wow, in coloration. It's a pretty color, yeah. Yeah. This plant can also grow in less favorable conditions than kalo, and benefits greatly by the addition of humus, which is a combination of uh, decayed plant material with the soil. Mm -hmm. Yes, the 
medicine and for propagation you could cut off just the tips of the stems like Winston is doing now and they would be trimmed and these root very very rapidly and these would be placed vertically in mounds of very soft soil like you see a small one here and this would allow the, the aeration of the root system and, and the best development of the tubers. <coughs> when, the, when the tubers were harvested, then they were baked, unpeeled in the emu, the underground oven, and peeled and eaten. Or another tasty way to fix them would be to mash them with coconut cream and bake them in the tea leaf. Sounds delicious. Mm -hmm. The breadfruit, or ulu, is a large tree and it produces these beautiful glossy dark green leaves and they have uh, cuts along the edge that are quite deep. And the other thing is that on the same tree they produce two different kinds of flowers, the male and the female flower clusters. Hmm, this, yeah, this is the male flower and it produces just pollen and this is the shape it has and the female flower is more rounded and it after pollination produces a tiny fruit and this fruit then grows together in a single structure so eventually you get the single large fruit which would weigh uh, two to three pounds on maturity and the fruits do not produce any viable seed so in order to get another ulu or breadfruit you'd have to look for sprouts from the root system or the uh, suckers hmm. another interesting feature to the ulu tree is that sticky white latex or sticky sap that comes from it and the Polynesians obtained it by cutting the bark and when you cut a piece of the ulu you can see that it starts to exude a white sap. It's a fresh cut but it looks like this and uh, the Polynesians use the sticky sap as a glue and we know that Hawaiians would use the ulu sap to seal the holes of the va or the Hawaiian canoe. Oh, the canoe. So it's like the original Elmer's glue they had. Pretty much. Kind yeah. of, yeah. When, when they wanted to eat the fruit, then they would uh, place the whole fruit in the, um, on the hot embers and that would broil it and eat it that way or bake it in the emu. Hmm. This is uh, yam or uhi, which is a, a vine with heart-shaped leaves and it looks somewhat like the Hawaiian sweet potato or uala, but it's an unrelated plant. Also, it's different from the yams of the grocery store that you see because those are really just sweet potatoes with very deep orange color to the mm. tubers. Well, also, you can distinguish this plant from the uala by the winged stem that you see here. Mm -hmm. And also, the leaves of the plant have uh, veins that go from the tip all the way to the base here. And also, it has very inconspicuous small flowers, and the uh, tuber is elongated and the flesh is crispy. The way they propagated the plant was either by sprouts or small tubers from the larger one, and those were planted at the base of a dead tree, so it would give it something to climb on. As far as a, a food plant, it was not widely propagated on the islands, but it was important in dry areas. Hmm. Winston, over here. You know, Priscilla, uh, maia, or banana, also was not a staple food in the Hawaiian diet, but it did provide a pleasing variety. And all but three of the Hawaiian maia were forbidden, or kapu, oh. by women. And uh, bananas were eaten raw, and sometimes uh, they were required to be cooked or baked before they could be eaten as well. And, and the plant itself, as you see behind us, the banana plant is really not a tree at all. It's a very large herb the world's largest herb because it will grow as tall as 20 feet high as you mm. can see and what looks like stems if you look at cross-section like you have right here it's really the leaf bases that are encircling each other and it makes a stem-like structure for the plant but it actually um, is still not very strong and is easily blown over by storms or wind When the stalk is about nine months old, it produces a large flowering structure which turns down as it forms. The fruit, likewise, are pendant or hanging down. Just the female flowers develop into the fruit which have no seeds, so it is propagated by new shoots at the base of the old stalk. Once the fruit is formed, the stalk dies. 
This is a young coconut palm, and the Hawaiians call it new. And it's an advantage to see um, the infl inflorescences on this young plant because they're down lower. And you can see that on the inflorescence, which is a collection of flowers, they're both the male and female flowers. Mm. The male flowers are the smaller ones, more numerous toward the ends of the uh, branches. And also you can see the bees are visiting those. They would just produce pollen. And the female flowers closer into the center of the stem are rounder like a little marble, and they will be the ones growing into the coconut fruit. Later on, you can see on the other side of the plant here, you can see an older flowering stem, which now all the male flowers have dropped off and the branches are dead. And you can see a definite small uh, miniature coconut fruit developing. The coconut tree was um, not a major food source for the Hawaiians. And perhaps that was because the temperatures are not here as hot as they are in other tropical countries and maybe it doesn't produce as heavily. But the Hawaiians really use the coconut, coconut in many ways. For example, the cloth, what's called coconut cloth, are fibers which are found at the base of the leaves, and they are sort of ready-made uh, material. You could use it for straining, um, or sort of like a cheesecloth material on the plant. Hmm. Right here is a open fruit of this palm tree, and as you can see, it has both a liquid and solid endosperm on the inside and uh, this provides nutrition for the embryo while it grows. Um, coconut cream that we associate coming from coconuts is actually produced by the grating of the coconut uh, meat in there and straining it to get that liquid. Um, the coconut water as you can see in there was also very useful uh, as a water source, you know, and traveling in journeys, you know, to the islands and the Polynesians probably had quite a few coconuts on the canoe as they traveled to these islands in the past. Yeah, so it would be a natural uh, storage for water for travels. Mm -hmm. This is the pia plant, an herb that has deeply divided leaves. It also has an interesting cluster of green flowers, and the bracts are thread-like. You know, there's a real favorite dish uh, made from this plant um, called halpia, and it's made by a mixture of coconut cream and an extract from the root of the pia plant. That was obtained by grinding up the root, which is very high in starch, and then washing it a number of times to remove unpleasant chemicals. Mm -hmm mixing it with the coconut cream and placing it in tea leaves and that was baked in the underground oven emu and that's the original source of halpia pudding. Mmm, yummy. Well Priscilla, this ohia ai or mountain apple tree forms a very large tree that has dark green, shiny, oval-shaped leaves. And in the springtime when it blooms, it sh forms hot, pink, fluffy, pom-pom-like flowers. Oh, those have been attractive. And, and then these are followed by fruit that are pear-shaped and have a brilliant red skin, and the flesh is white and crisp inside. These have been a really juicy treat in season. Sugarcane, or ko as the Hawaiians called it, is a giant grass that can grow up to 15 feet and in some cases even taller. Uh, the Hawaiians grew many different cultivars and this is a really beautiful one that has nice variegated leaves but they also are remarkable in the coloration of how their stems are varied. And, uh, this is just a small example of different types we have in our collection. This one is called manulele which means flying bird and was associated with love potions. This one right here is called Wahia Pele, and it's the smoky color of Pele. And this is Paco Valley, just to name a few. And the Hawaiians grew uh, the cane, of course, for its real sweet juice, and they didn't crystallize it like sugar the way we know how to do it. And they'd either chew it like the way you like to eat it, right? Mm -hmm. Just chew right on Delicious. the stem. You know? Or they would squeeze out the liquid from the plant, and then they would eat it with very bitter medicines to make it more palatable. Mm. Want some? Oh, yeah. Good. Mm -hmm. 
Wasn't that great? Very interesting, huh? Anyway, so we'd like to thank Priscilla Millen and Winston Morton okay, for appearing in the video for us. Okay, that's very nice. And um, what we'll do is we'll do a summary, okay? First of all, reminder that traditional eating is actually healthy, okay? Taking traditional people's, you know, indigenous people's food, you know, whatever culture that you come from, very healthy for us, okay? Second point is that the first people of Hawaii, their food plants that they brought with them, they provided everything they needed, delicious and good to eat as well. Okay, very healthy for you. And then lastly, we sort of had a little bit, you know, not in the video, but in the lecture, a little bit about food from the sea. All right, so that's what we have for you today. Okay, hope you enjoyed it and see you next time. Aloha.